This talk is about the ethics of medical emergencies with artificially intelligent, of handling medical emergencies with artificially intelligent black boxes. And I have a designer friend who saw this slide and said, Eric, that is so ugly. You use three different fonts, which is, I guess, breaking a design rule. Uh, <laughs> and I said, well, the reason I did it is I want to highlight that we are integrating three very disparate academic areas, ethics, which is humanities, therefore in a script font, medical emergencies or emergency medicine, which is very urgent, so I put it in a military font, and then artificial intelligence, which is digital, so I tried to use a computer console font. Um, this is an outline for today. This outline is the same as what's here, okay? Uh, so you can look at, I want to make sure, can everybody see this type? From the back of the room, too? It's clear? OK, great. So <clears throat> first, we'll talk about the goal of today. Uh, and then we're going to do an interactive thought experiment called the chest pain problem. I'm going to try and move as quickly as possible through some prerequisite concepts to help you understand the ethical analysis that follows. And then we have a longer portion, which will be a, an interactive uh, uh, investigation of ethical concerns of artificial intelligence, particularly in emergency medicine, and we'll conclude with some next steps. So here we are at the introduction. Today's goal is to develop a set of ethical guidelines for the use of black box artificial intelligence in emergency medicine. Such a set of ethical guidelines has not been published anywhere in the literature. But the takeaway, and if you're going to take one thing away from today's lecture, I want you to think about how you can develop a set of ethical guidelines for your field or refine that set uh, if there is already one. And so what I hope to do is to give you the tools and a method to do in-depth philosophical ethical research into the issues in your field. So we'll start with a thought experiment. I call it the chest pain problem. This is you. You are a doctor in an emergency room. And a patient shows up. His name is Oscar. He's from Uppsala. Oscar's in his 50s. He has no history of heart disease, but he is hypertensive. That means he has high blood pressure. And a few hours ago, he had severe chest pain, which is now gone. So he showed up in your ER. And <clears throat> your immediate worry is, oh, maybe he had a heart attack. Now, one way of testing to see if a patient has recently had a heart attack is to measure the levels of a protein called troponin T, which is in their blood. This is the troponin T test, and it's right 88% of the time. So you give Oscar the troponin T test. It comes out negative. Oscar is happy. And you tell him you can go home. OK. So as he's on his way out the door, some researchers from Uppsala University show up in your emergency room, OK? And they've got this great computer. And this computer, it can predict whether or not somebody had a heart attack with an accuracy of 94%. Mm -hmm. And it does that by taking a whole bunch of variables that you as the doctor did not take into account when you did the troponin T test, things like Besides gender, uh, 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 triglyceride levels, uh, blood pressure, uh, uh, whether the guy is a smoker or not a smoker. And they say, listen, can we please use our artificial intelligence to see whether Oscar had a heart attack? And well, you think about it, there's one catch. This computer is a black box. So you, the doctor, don't know how the computer reasons. You only know what the output is going to be, OK? So you're an open-minded person. And Oscar is like, well, what the heck? I like computers. So you decide to give it a shot. And the computer returns an output that Oscar did have a heart attack. What does that mean? That means he needs to get to surgery as soon as possible and get something called an angioplasty, which has a 3% death rate. Now, that may not sound like much, but if I told you you had a 3% chance of dying if you were going to cross the road to the University of Chukuzit right now, you would probably be a little hesitant to cross that road, right? Okay. 
So, so surgery is not a negligible uh, 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 risk in this case. So I'm going to stop here. Does everybody feel like, raise your hand if you feel like you understand the scenario, basically? Yeah? OK, great. So my question is, what should you do? I open the floor. There are no right or wrong answers. The doctor, you're the doctor. Yeah. Give him the surgery. You are Vic Victor? Yes. Yes, Victor. Give him the surgery. Yes. Why? Well, partly because uh, I would say that the three percent uh, risk mm -hmm. of the patient dying is negligible in terms of what could happen if you did not give him the surgery. Okay. Yeah. I would do some more tests on the patient because there must be more tests. The doctor can do besides the troponin tests. Okay. There are more. But the doctor must know what kind of variables the black box elaborate. Okay. Or, Good. Yeah. Or not. And he does. Yes. He can know the input. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. can know the input. Great. Yes. Uh, he doesn't know how they're weighted. No. no. Yeah. yeah. Why should I trust the troponin T test? Well, it's right. Eighty-eight percent of the time. Yeah. Should you trust the doctor who created that test then? It's kind of... Okay. Yeah. A good question. Yeah. Maybe the troponin and T test is, uh, you know, that maybe you're not satisfied with that success rate, 88%. Yeah. yeah? Other your actions. Well, thank you. And the troponin test, is it, like, is there any room for human error there? Like, can the doctor actually make some sort of mistake while conducting the test? For the purpose of our thought experiment, let's say no. Okay. It's a routine test, and it is in real life. Yeah. Hmm. OK, well, in about 15 minutes, we're going to return to exactly this problem. But first, I want to give you tools to help you analyze this and other thought experiments that are related to it, and hopefully uh, ethics in your field. Uh, so we're now at this part of the outline, prerequisite concepts. We'll start with what is art. Definitions are very important in ethics. So we'll start with definitions. So we're going to talk about what is artificial intelligence. So <clears throat> for the purposes of this talk, when we're talking about AI, we're going to be talking about non-genetically evolved agents. Okay? So that means that I'm not AI. You're presumably not AI, <laughs> although you, <laughs> you never know, you know, right? Uh, but for example, this is a schematic of a biocomputer built from biological materials. These such things are beginning to exist. That is AI, even though it's made from biology materials. And computers which duplicate themselves or which reproduce or create other computers are also AI. AI, and this is uh, according to a pretty good definition by one of the major texts by Russell and Norvig in Artificial Intelligence, AI acts rationally or it acts humanly, or it thinks rationally, or it thinks humanly. And you can draw a Venn diagram of those four concepts, and any given AI can fit anywhere inside that Venn diagram. right? So it's a, a, a family resemblance sort of definition, as Wittgenstein might put it. Uh, OK, what are black boxes? We're here now. Black box is a computer whereby you know the input and you know the output, but you don't know how it got from the input to the output. It's easy to understand black boxes when you contrast them with white boxes. That's my terminology. And a few other people. Sometimes they say transparent. This is an actual Bayesian network, which is a white box, for determining cardiovascular event risk. And it's a set of conditional probabilities. So you have variables like triglyceride levels, age, blood pressure, smoking, and so forth. Each of them is weighted into an integer score, which is added together. And you end up with a final score for a given patient that predicts their risk of having a cardiovascular event. Uh, Bayesian networks can get really complicated. This is one for predicting liver disorder. There are 94 variables there. If you did the conditional probability of each variable against each other variable, you'd end up with 2 to the 93rd minus 1 calculations, which is computationally very heavy. But what's nice about Bayesian networks 
is we can put them in a topographic representation and eliminate the, con the conditional probabilities that don't really matter and end up with a chart like this, which is complicated but digestible to the human being, right? To our intellect. Okay. So <clears throat> a white box <clears throat> takes variables, gives you conditional probabilities, and then gives you a joint probability at the end, and everything is clear. Ha, ah, but now black boxes. The classic one is the artificial neural network, which I, I get, would guess, can I just get a ray of, show of hands? Everybody in the room has a basic idea of what an artificial neural network is. Great, so I don't have to explain it in too much detail. It's, simply put, a computer which is attempted to be built like a human brain, right? So, <clears throat> it, in its smallest unit, it looks like this. You have uh, the outputs of functions, uh, which kind of function like neurons. They're summed together and weighted, uh, and then they're put into another function, and then that function creates an output, and they're trained by putting huge amounts of data at the beginning and uh, testing to see whether the neural network pr produces what you want at the end. Uh, and sometimes that information is back propagated against the network. And neural networks can have thousands, even millions of nodes. And the, the functions in there are not necessarily functions uh, that human beings can easily grasp. They could be sigmoidal. They could be of multiple exponents. They could be functions of topographically in, in 20D space. It's, it's, uh, uh, neural networks are constantly changing as well. So they're very hard to look into and understand. And in fact, and this is according to the US Defense Agency, so it's got to be right, right. There's an inherent tension between machine learning performance, predictive accuracy, and explainability. And often the highest performing methods are the least explainable. That's where we're going with artificial intelligence. So are black boxes really, truly black boxes? Of course, there have been attempts to penetrate them. This is a great one, Google's Deep Dream project. In short, they intercepted sort of what the black box is perceiving in the process of recognizing whether a banana is a banana in an image. And it came out something like this. And it's dreamlike, right? Have you ever had a dream where like, there was a person in the dream and they, you knew that it was a person, but they didn't look like the person you were thinking about? Has anybody ever had that experience? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So that's just kind of what Deep Dream does. Here's some more Deep Dream images. This is a starfish. This is an ant. This is a measuring cup. This is a, a heart of beast, which is an African antelope. One more really cool attempt to penetrate black boxes is rationalization by a guy named Mark Riedel. He trained a computer to play the 1980s video game Frogger, in which a frog has to cross the road and avoid boulders and uh, cars. Um, and he had the computer play alongside human beings and then try to create a translation matrix between like, the computer's reasoning and the natural language. And they took that translation matrix and he put it back into the original AI so that the AI would narrate its decision-making process when playing Frogger. So this is the output of the AI. Amongst the boulders, couldn't go through, need to wait patiently for a break between the boulders. And fascinatingly, human subjects, when they interacted with this AI, said he felt like a friend rather than a robot. Mm. So gray boxes have an input and an output and an internal function, or I should say internal workings which are more or less comprehensible. It may be that as these networks become more complex, they become correspondingly less transparent and difficult to audit and analyze. AI may eventually become significantly more intelligent than human beings, such that they will surpass the analytical abilities of humans altogether. And if that sounds scary to you, there are actually people like Ray Kurzweil, we'll talk about him later, who want this to happen. And they want to see it happen as fast as possible, because they think this will usher in a new age of humanity with super intelligent computers making our lives much better. All right, we're here now. Quick definition of emergency medicine. Uh, it's the diagnosis and treatment of unforeseen illness or injury. 
the one point I want to make about it is you probably think of emergency medicine as like in an emergency room, like, uh, like ER, the TV show, right? But it doesn't just occur in places like that. It also occurs in ambulances and in disaster zones and in telemedicine and in humanitarian medicine. So this is, this is me in a roving emergency medical clinic in Nicaragua. Why are we talking about emergency medicine? Well, it's really important because it's about life or death. Hmm? If we're going to do the ethics of something, we might as well start with doing the ethics of something that has such an important effect on human beings. All right, finally, our ethical analysis. Um, we are going to be talking about two different ways to analyze uh, ethical uh, dilemmas. We'll be talking about codes of ethics and then normative ethics. Uh, so <clears throat> first, I'm going to present to you three codes of ethics and a few principles that matter for our purposes. The Asilomar principles were agreed on by a group of computer, uh, AI experts in California in 2017 in a place called the Asilomar Institute. They said, among other things, that AI should be safe and secure, that humans should choose how to delegate decisions to AI, that people should have the right to access, manage, and control their data that's used by the AI. And if an AI causes harm, we should be able to figure out why. Another code of ethics from the American College of Emergency Physicians. Emergency physicians should maintain their knowledge and skills. They should update them. Patients' informed consent must usually be obtained. Of course, if the patient is unconscious, that may be impossible. Action should be quick. And treatment should be unbiased and unprejudiced toward a social group. Uh, and then there was a roadmap for medical AI, which was uh, d talked about in the last year uh, by medical AI experts. Um, they say we should use the best knowledge we have available when we're making medical AI decisions. We should adopt tools widely and extensively, and there should be the continuous improvement of knowledge and clinical decision support methods. So those are some codes of ethics that will help inform our analysis in a moment. Normative ethics. There are two traditions in academic ethics that we're going to draw from. Uh, the first comes from this guy. Does anybody know who he is? Come on. No philosophy geeks? Anyone? Nope. OK, it's Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait, wait till I show you Judd Stewart Mill. Yeah. I always gave the answer to that one. Right, that's true, yeah. Kant is probably the most famous representative of deontology. Deontology, in essence, says that whether an action is right or wrong, does not depend on the consequences of the action. It only depends on whether the action itself is universalizable, uh, whether if everybody did the same action for the same reasons, that would not yield a logical contradiction or that would not yield something that we don't want in the world. So this is the German version of his famous categorical imperative, his basic ethical law. I'm not going to uh, torture you with reading it in German. The English translation is, Act only according to that maxim, whereby you can, at the same time, will, that it should become a universal law. If you don't understand that, don't worry. We'll go back to Kant later. Uh, and there's John Stuart Mill. Deontology is usually <laughs> um, uh, uh, sort of uh, set up against consequentialism in the history of philosophy. Consequentialism, as you may guess, says that the rightness or wrongness of an action has to do with what are the consequences, the outcome of the action. Uh, and Mill famously wrote that all action is for the sake of some end, and rules of action must take their whole character and color from the end to which they are subservient. Again, some complicated philosophical language. Don't stress too much if you don't understand it. We'll go back to that. Um, finally, our method today. So, I'm going to isolate three areas in AI ethics that really concern me personally. This is not a comprehensive list, but these are things I think really matter. And I'm going to divide them into seven dilemmas, which we'll discuss. And then each dilemma will illustrate a principle uh, in, in uh, AI ethics. Uh, my method comes from this 
hero of mine, uh, Francis Cam, who, uh, whose fascinating book, Creation and Abortion, uses a similar method where she goes through a series of thought experiments which are sometimes fantastical or unrealistic, but we look at them because they, they serve to illustrate exactly the ethical principle that is at stake. Uh, that's the book, and this is how she put it. The fact that these cases are hypothetical and often fantastic distinguishes this enterprise from real life dilemmas. Real life cases often do not contain the relevant characteristics to help in our search for principles. All right, so I've gone through all our prerequisite concepts and given you some tools now for doing ethical analysis. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. You rule up, you utilitarianism yes. from the normative ethics? Why any reason? Mm, uh, so I didn't rule out utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a subset of theories inside consequentialism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's where you miss the, 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 the common good for everyone. And so on and so forth. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, because because uh, yeah. said utilitarianism should have some sort of qualities that in this, you didn't have yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, utilitarianism should have some sort of qualities. So, the qualities that was mentioned here. Are you in, talking about... In your consequentialism. Yeah. yeah. Right, so are you talking, for example, about rule utilitarianism? No. Yeah. So, so within these traditions, there are centuries of debate about how best to interpret uh, their, their, their sort of basic premises. And I, I think this is what you're referring to. Um, and I think it's, I'm glad you brought that up, because when we're doing our analysis, we have to take into account things like rule utilitarianism, yeah, as, w as well as classical, simple act utilitarianism. Yeah, great, thank you. Are there any other questions about the tools that I've hopefully given you today? Okay, let's analyze. We'll go back to where we were. There's Oscar. The, the, the computer says he had a heart attack. And remember I asked you what you should do in this situation. I'm going to refine the question a little bit. I'm going to ask you the question, do you ask Oscar's consent for this surgery? Okay. And the principle we're getting here, trying to understand, is under what circumstances should you trust a black box, particularly when you have a contradictory source of knowledge about the medical situation? In this case, the contradictory source of knowledge is the troponin and T-test. Thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, going back to like the, the answer I gave previously, yes. I would inform Oscar about both of these. I would say that we did the troponin T test mm -hmm. and it's 88% accurate and it said no. Mm -hmm. We ran it through a computer program with a 94% success rate and it said yes. Mm -hmm. The way to deal with this would be to uh, give you a surgery, and it has this percent of failure, what would you like to do? Okay. So I would, I would put him in uh, the spot of choosing himself, mm -hmm. but then again, you know, he might divert that to me as a medical professional, mm -hmm. where I would give him the surgery, or he would say, no, I don't trust computers. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like Oscar kind of did trust computers a little bit. <laughs> Maybe he would go with yes. Okay. But I, I would, I would say that just giving him the the opportunity to hear the different uh, outcomes, I would say, from different tests and form his own opinion based okay. upon it, would be uh, ethical, in my opinion. Okay. Responses to that. Well, it could be a situation that you can't make a decision. Yes. In this scenario, he's okay. Okay. We are going to deal with that scenario in just a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I'm thinking of you probably know person-centered care. Uh, patient-centered care, yeah. Yeah, patient-centered care or person-centered care, yeah. depending on which <laughs> yes. which varies. Sure. Uh, and and hearing what Victor talks about, I mean, the part of of asking Oscar here is is sort of in line with this thinking of, of how to, to give care, that yep. you should have a, a communication and, and with the patient yep. and, and, and such. Uh, for me, the problem with AI or other 
ways of measuring. So, so AI for me becomes a, a way of, of um, or rather, it's easy for Oscar to interpret uh, the AI as more like trustworthy okay. because it's doing measurements and it's a computer and okay. we're used to computers having the right answers. Mm -hmm. So and not so. So for me, it's not only about the numbers, 88 or 94%. It's okay. also about the way we actually uh, evaluate the results from various sources. So, so what, how would Oscar, how does he evaluate the, the doctor's okay. uh, saying uh -huh. compared to the AI? Okay. Uh, and, and that sort of, well, I'm, I'm trying to find a good way to get it. I don't mm -hmm. know if you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, 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 for, for me, it's a big difference between a doctor saying something and okay. an AI saying something. Okay. Uh, and, and a question of, I think it's also an ethical question whether Oscar could trust either or. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Thank I, you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I have a thing about the thing that you said in great circumstances, you can trust the black mm -hmm. box when mm -hmm. you have contradictory sources. Then my question would be that why would it differ if the contradictory result is coming from a black box mm -hmm. or coming mm -hmm. from another set of results? Uh -huh. Like mm -hmm. you can actually run two type mm -hmm. of experiments mm -hmm. and they could contradict. Mm -hmm. Sure. Why does black boxing get now actually matters right now? Okay. Okay, we'll talk about that and the irrational primacy effect in a, in a moment. <laughs> yeah. well, yes. Another so, reflection is whether yes. or not it, it is actually contradictory because if you just, just look at the numbers, I mean, let's say it's 88% for the one and on the other one you have 94%. So, I mean, Oscar might be in that percentage rate that, right. I mean, there is a 12% fault rate mm -hmm. to the trouble in t test. And yes, the six percent for the other one. So perhaps in this case, the AI was a better mechanism to actually identify that he was part of those kind of twelve percent. So I mean, in one sense, it might not be a contradictory. It's kind of an additive. It's one more source uh -huh. that is more fine grained. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. So from that, and I mean, also if the consequence of not doing the surgery would be that you die. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, if we just compare the percentage, I mean, mm -hmm. that then we can, can, can compare 94% with the other 97% you get with the surgery. Let's do it. Let's compare. OK, so this is my model of the brain of a doctor, OK, from my experience working in an emergency room, OK? He's thinking, well, the trumpet in T test is negative, so it has an 88% chance of being right. The black box was positive, and that has a 94% chance of being right. Uh, now, Oscar has hypertension, high blood pressure, right? So this increases the chance he had a heart attack. But on the other hand, he's got no history of heart disease, so that decreases the chance. So should I perform the angioplasty? Well, no. If I don't, there's a chance of further damage, which is unknown. If I do, there's a 3% chance of death, right? Maybe. I should investigate further, but then the more time that I take investigating, the higher chance there is that he'll have another heart attack, right? So this is where doctors are stuck. Does this sort of represent your, your, the way you're reasoning about this situation? Do you think this is fair to doctors? OK, relatively. <laughs> A couple of principles are important. We talked about quick action. Right? So we know that's important. right? And then you say, well, is there a contradiction here? Here's a quote about Watson, which is, you might know is a fantastic AI system. Given the amount of complexity of patient data, physicians would be remiss not to consult intelligent systems such as Watson. In the future, it may very well be considered unethical not to consult Watson or intelligent systems like it for a second opinion. right? So a lot of the focus in the field is on uh, AI as a second opinion. But there, there are two traps in doing that. The first is you take the AI's conclusion as a piece of evidence for the doctor's opinion. Okay? So this should be the, not he. 
the EA, the AI bases its conclusions on real life evidence, but its conclusion is not itself evidence. Does that make sense? The other problem we have is the irrational primacy effect. That is a cognitive bias whereby the doctor lets the AI's early opinion influence her or his own search for more evidence, right? And then ends up trying to confirm or deny the AI's opinion rather than independently reach a conclusion from the facts that he, he or she gathers. Yeah? Couldn't that be said about the dopamine test as well, man? Hmm. Interesting. So, it, can you explain for everybody? Well, that, that's, that's pretty much my explanation. Okay. I, I, yeah, okay. I mean, if, if I get a test yes. and, I, and, I, and I personally believe that test, that chemical test, to be more accurate than I would say that an AI is, mm -hmm. wouldn't I then also be uh, biased towards that compared to biased towards the AI? Interesting. Whereas I would kind of forego the percentual... Uh, that Kathleen talked about, mm -hmm. the essential differences where actually listening to the AI would be more beneficial. Mm -hmm. And for instance, like, uh, uh, I don't want to go off topic too much, yeah. but I think it's it's connected to, to Watson because that has been used by oncologists to kind of look at cancer results and, and that sort of thing. And and uh, where it has actually helped yes. from, what, from my understanding, the oncologists that are looking at cancer and the way to treat it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I would be more inclined to to kind of uh, go towards the route of it being unethical not to take that into consideration. Okay. And I believe personally that you can have bias both ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be an AI or not. Got it. Uh, I saw a hand and then a hand. Yeah. Uh, medicine is an evidence-based uh, work. work. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. Uh, the t test is evidence based, and the result of the AI is is perhaps not e e evidence based or t tested as an evidence for uh, diagnosis. The, the AI result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you, as a doctor, have has to trust the evidence based results more than not evidence based results. And therefore, the troponin and t test. Yeah. Okay. And also, like the broken test is more widely used than the um, artificial intelligence solution. So maybe like you go for the the one that it's used like since I don't know like uh, since many years than the other one that's like still new and mm -hmm. not um, not tested. Okay. Maybe. As much as yeah. troponin T. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, it depends, like, is a computer scientist telling me it says 95% accuracy, or has, has it been through, like, medical trials? It's like the dopamine t test. It's, it becomes a question about, like, the meta science about mm -hmm. like, what accuracy is with regards to medicine, uh, as space science, or mm -hmm. computer science, or something more like speak that. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, let's apply the principle of generosity to our. Uh, Uppsala researchers, right, and say, okay, that computer has been tested on a thousand patients and found to be correct, or ten thousand patients, or something like that. Then it's pretty much evidence, right? Wouldn't it be counted as that? Uh, well, yeah. What, yeah what, what do you think, Patrick? Uh, I just uh, noticed one thing that when we're talking about the test of uh, troponin T, it's a test for the occurrence of Propamin T, where the other, the computer is a test for whether or not it has a heart failure. I mean, uh, so so it seems to me that the level of interpreting the result is vastly different, uh, or it, it's a big difference because you can see, I would say, one step further, and the test is not the judgment, so to say. The test is never setting even out to do a judgment. It's just a test for uh, if you can find a certain uh, protein and a statistical model behind that, mm -hmm. of course, that weights the evidence. So I think that's another aspect of, of this black box. Mm -hmm. We know more what it, uh, exists, but we also are expected to do the judgment, so mm -hmm. to say. 
this. What's fantastic here is the nuance to which you are bringing your ideas into this question. I'm going to propose a guideline that hopefully will help the situation. This is my first guideline. An emergency medicine clinician should use any available well-trained black box and incorporate its output into his or her analysis, provided that he or she is not unduly influenced by that output into misanalyzing the case, right? So doctors should be aware of the traps and be aware of the dialogue that you are having right now before they start just randomly applying AI to the clinical situations. Um, let's do a consequentialist test on this. One of the consequences of using AI whenever possible is that it makes people nervous. In 2017, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the accounting firm, put out a, a study of 12,000 people in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And guess what percent of people would not trust an AI to make their medical decisions? Anybody have a, to throw out a figure? 70? 70, wow. <laughs> okay, now you outdid me. It's 38, it's 38. So, okay, so yeah. So 40%. Two-fifths. Two-fifths of people, two out of every five people, would not want an AI to make their medical decisions. Uh, it, so the negative consequences, of, patient anxiety is a, is a major negative consequence. Now, of course, in an emergency room, if a person is dying, we, a doctor often will override that patient's anxiety in order to save their life, right? Um, OK, let's move on to our next thought experiment. Uh, same situation, but now you are Oscar, okay? Do you give consent, okay? Now, this seems like maybe the same question, but we're looking at a different principle. Can a patient give true informed consent when the decision is based on a black box's output? Yeah, uh, then you, yeah. You Go ahead, sir. Okay, I feel like I just keep talking. No. <laughs> uh, but, but, um, Going back uh, just a little bit to, to the guideline there, I'm thinking that could easily be kind of circumvented by, you know, people can give their consent or revoke their consent to be resuscitated, mm -hmm. like a do not resuscitate order. Mm -hmm. Do not give AI permission to do my test. Nice. Could be another one. Excellent. Uh, okay, so moving back to me being the patient, uh, and, and the question, uh, if I understood it right, was can I give informed consent? Uh, but then on the other hand, can I give informed consent in any medical field that I'm not well versed in, which is okay. any medical field? And, and also, I don't quote me on this, but I do, <laughs> I do think yeah. that in, in some study that was being performed on like general mm -hmm. practitioners, yeah. a very large amount, I, I want to say 70%, like admitted to actually just Googling a lot of the... <laughs> yeah. A lot of the, yeah. the, like symptoms yeah. that the patient was yeah. describing if yeah. they weren't really sure, yeah. and then kind of rolling with it. Right. So, so I think that we as patients mm -hmm. give doctors a whole lot more leeway mm -hmm. and thinking that they're much more like uh, omnipotent than they actually are. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a doctor kind of googling your symptoms wouldn't be that much different from an AI just running the tests on me to begin with. Okay. Uh, so I would say a patient that is not a doctor themselves cannot give informed consent because they're not a doctor. They don't know what's going on uh -huh. either way. So, so like if I give my consent to a doctor give, that gives me a recommendation, yeah. it's still not informed consent because I have no idea if the doctor, if he or she is, is correct in okay. their assessment. Okay. Uh, so yeah, but I would still give the consent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely think that informed consent can be questioned here. Uh, consent is one thing, mm -hmm. informed another thing. But, but I'm also thinking about the, the trust and, and accountability issues here. Because uh, it's, I think still it's easier for me as a person at least to, to trust the, the doctor and the doctor's opinion and doctor saying based on the fact that he or she is a, a human being mm -hmm. and a person mm -hmm. that is accountable for his mm -hmm. or her actions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So if everything goes well and, mm -hmm. and the, the AI is right, mm -hmm. which I trust that and I get my, my surgery and, and I, I afterwards I wake up and feel well, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. But what if the three percent and I die mm -hmm. and my relatives start to question what was going on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who will take the blame here? Great question. Uh, we'll deal with that. We're also dealing with living wills. Okay. Responses or okay. Okay, we got a debate going on. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, like, uh, oh man, I, I kind of lost it a little bit. Could you just quickly reiterate what you said, Robin, about? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, it's about trust and accountability. Uh, so, so would I trust a doctor more or an AI more? Oh, yes. That that is a personal thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would say that I would trust an AI more simply because it is not human to the same extent. I mean, hmm. we do trust doctors to be objective, but a doctor can like you more or less. A doctor can, can kind of have hopes for you, whereas an AI will just be very cold and calculating. Hmm. And, and I have like the same kind of idea. If I go into surgery, I don't want an empathic person to operate on me. Mm. I want someone that is devoid of feeling. I want a psychopath. <laughs> because then I know that they will kind of just function as a robot when they're doing their thing. Yeah. And when they're functioning... Oh, but I don't agree. I want someone who cares about whether I live or die. I don't. Okay. Okay. Oh. I, I, I want them to yeah. be excellent at what they're doing, but not yeah. caring. Yeah, but I, I would argue that... <laughs> If they're a psychopath and they don't care if I live or die, they just care about doing the best they can. No, 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 no but, but I can rephrase mm -hmm. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'm, but the way I see it, I agree with you that the, the doctor should care. Mm -hmm. But I agree also with you on the part that because we have doctors that are pro surgery, like some doctors, they immediately say, "Oh, let's just do a surgery because they're just pro surgery." Mm -hmm. I do not want that type of a doctor to examine me because mm -hmm. either way, no matter what the result is, they just are so much in favor of one single method in mm -hmm. medicine that they always select that one and they try to neglect other evidence. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I agree mm -hmm. with you that you want a cold, illogical system to mm -hmm. make that decision. Mm -hmm. But when the surgery is happening, yeah, I'm with you. But well, <laughs> the, the system doesn't make the ah, okay. surgery decision. Okay. Like, either way, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 Two, two quick comments and then we're going to keep right. moving. Yeah. Uh, in this example, we would also, but we must also question if Oscar would even know that an AI is is a part of the doctor's analysis of the situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I visit the doctor, he he, he or she doesn't says everything that is, that is a base of his or her decision. So mm -hmm. why should Oscar be aware that this that that is it has been an AI, a, AI mm -hmm. to support the mm -hmm. the, the doctor? So you're arguing from a, a point of authority? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I'm just thinking about this uh, informed consent and also, I mean, the trust. If you trust the doctor more than uh, an AI. One problem that I have with an AI is that uh, it's really hard for me as a patient to trust it more. I can question the doctor. I can say, okay, what is your rationality here and it, then if they say uh, say well my phd degree in uh, informatics uh, <laughs> is quite solid in this area so we should probably cut and then i know that ah okay let's not listen too much i want a second opinion on this and so uh, whereby i mean an ai as you had with a uh, frogger game mm -hmm. but that's a good example that would show some kind of reasonable line of thought that I can evaluate. And by that, I can at least feel that in my simple uh, world, that would be an informed consent that I can understand some rationality behind it. Okay. And at least can see if there are some clear logical fallacies. <clears throat> so, thank you. One... Um a uh, common definition of informed consent requires three things, four things, competence, voluntariness, disclosure, and understanding. So let's assume that Oscar's competent. Let's assume that the, this is a voluntary situation where he's giving his consent. The question of disclosure is kind of problematic here, right? Um, uh, 
bear with me for just one second while I go down to my notes here. What is really crucial in disclosure is what doctors call the reasonable practice standard, okay? Which says that whether information is pertinent or material is to be measured by the significance that a reasonable person would attach to it in deciding whether to undergo a procedure. And the issue here is that there is no consensus on the definition of material information or a reasonable person, okay? So I am a cognitive science slash human computer interaction and social media student. I work with computers every day. So I trust AI, right? Relative to say a hunter gatherer who never used electricity or my 101 year old grandma who has never written an email, right? Uh, those people might be very concerned about any doctor who turns diagnostic authority over the authority you're talking about to an unfeeling machine, right? Um, so on the other hand, if we look at understanding as an important part of consent, Oscar may never understand the internal workings of the black box, but if he does know something about his engineering architecture, like I do and like, most of, like everybody in the room probably does, uh, he might be more amenable to trusting it. I mean, Patrick, you're a computer person, right? Uh, who said they would trust the, the AI because it's unfeeling, right? Uh, you're, maybe you're also a computer scientist or... No, so, informatics. Informatics, yeah. sure, yeah, right? So, so to us, computers are part of our everyday world, right? But um, it may also be reassuring to Oscar to know that black boxes are impossible to understand, not only for him, but also for the doctor, so that everybody's in the same epistemic situation, right? So I propose the following guideline. The public should be educated with basic knowledge about black boxes, including emergency medicine black boxes. And I think that that education uh, has to include the following knowledge. Black boxes work like human brains. They are trained by humans. They are reliable to a certain percent that Black boxes take inputs that the physician knows and that clinicians also don't know the inner workings of a black box. Um, there is an objection, a deontological objection to my guideline uh, from religious communities which oppose modern medicine. It's a fascinating discussion, but I want to skip over it for the purposes of time and move to the next uh, um, dilemma. So is everybody ready for that? Okay. Oscar arrives unconscious. He cannot give consent. No surrogate decision makers are there to make decisions on his behalf. Do you go ahead with the AI and operate? So does a doctor, the principle we're looking at is does a doctor assume that an incapable person would consent to using black box information or not? Yeah. Yeah, but isn't that just ordinary medical ethics at play here mm -hmm. uh, that if someone is unconscious the doctor will do whatever he or she uh, sees a, as, as the best way of helping the patient sure um, so so it's quite a different sort of situation mm -hmm. um, yes I'm, I'm still a, a little bit against AI but, but <laughs> so it's not that I, I, I I'm not turning my mind on that. But, but in this case, it, it's, it's, for me, it's the, it's the doctor's decision mm -hmm. whether or not. Right. So my question is, what do you decide? As a, you're as a doctor, principle. as a doctor, I would, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't even uh, be concerned about the consent. I would be concerned about my own uh, evaluation of the the, the output the AI gives. If I feel that it helps me to make a good decision, mm -hmm. then I would trust it. Okay, uh, around the room. Yeah. Did I see your hand up? Oh, no. Over here? If, yeah, yeah. If we were doctor, yeah. would, would this be an ethical question? It, as, as opposed to not being an ethical question. So you, you think perhaps this is not an ethical question, but rather a procedural question? Yeah. Can you explain? Well, I, I think Doctors have procedures when it comes to unconscious patients and so on and so forth that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. That is, you are posing us uh, as an ethical situation. Mm -hmm. 
But for a doctor, maybe it is not. Okay. But I don't know because I'm not doctor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is the point uh, f- from our point of view that we don't really know how a doctor uh, reason in uh-huh. a situation like this. Yes, okay. Is it an ethical situation for, for a doctor? Sure. Perhaps, uh, the, perhaps not. But I, I have mm. no idea. Uh, I would argue it is, okay. uh, but I want to hear from the room, and we can talk about that more in, uh, yeah, in a minute. It, it'll come up. Yeah. Uh, but I would say, I mean, with a heart attack, it's kind of because you can't remove the heart, but and just say, oh well, you know. <laughs> but but it could have been a situation where the doctor has to decide, okay, if I go with the AI, I amputate the leg, right? If I don't, you know, the leg is still there, and there might not have been a problem in the first case because mm. one test showed that there wasn't a problem. But, and then when the patient wakes up, it's like, I'm without a leg. They, I, they probably would have wanted to be in on that decision is what I'm thinking. So it's a very ethical decision. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Fatima and then uh, uh, and Victor. Yeah. yeah. I would say if I, as a doctor, if I decide I'm sur- doing the surgery, no matter what my decision is, I would only do it if I take the responsibility of the AI later on also. Yeah. Okay. So that they will not, if something happens to the patient, okay. I cannot go and say, oh, it wasn't me, the AI said no. that. Okay, all right. Because the accountability over here is right. Okay, great. Victor? I agree with Pokemon on, on that part, but, but I would also say that, like, uh, uh, in terms of consent, I, I do not see a difference between using the the AI kind of prediction as to checking for a second opinion, mm-hmm. or I would go so far to say that I don't see a difference between that and taking a blood test from the patient, because you can, uh, like you said, you know, let's skip over the religious part. There are still people that wouldn't want their blood to be taken right. and run tests on. Right. But if someone comes in unconscious, you still take their blood and you right. still run tests on it. Right. So and and. From what I understand, that is still being done on people that are unconscious. Mm. Uh, so, so I don't see a difference between the two. And I would also say that, like in in terms of what you said, Ulrika, about like amputating a leg or something, like uh, if someone comes in unconscious and has like a mangled leg or something. Uh, but see, then you know there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, you didn't know for sure there was a problem. Okay. That's the difference. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So, okay, echo- <laughs> about the leg, but the rest continues. The rest sticks. Echoing your concerns, I have some rhetorical questions. What do we do if Oscar awakes and is upset that you use the technology that he finds suspect? Or worse yet, what do you do if Oscar dies and his family members say they would have discarded the black box findings? Right? Very challenging situation. Here's a guideline. Ideally, as an advanced healthcare directive, sometimes called a living will, persons would have the option to state whether or not they would permit a black box to play a role in their emergency medical decisions when unable to give consent themselves. And I, this is building on something that you were saying earlier, right? There are concerns. First of all, living wills are problematic in general. Uh, people are likely grossly to underestimate their desire to have a medical intervention should they become ill. Mm -hmm. So people often say, oh, I don't want to be treated if I get into a really bad. And then when they get there, they're like, treat me, treat me, right? So that's one problem, which is a consequentialist problem. Uh, And then there's the other interesting thing that when you think about it, medicine is already full of black boxes. This is lithium, and lithium is a black box. We don't know the mechanism of action of lithium or paracetamol or modafinil. Right? But we use them all the time. We know they're effective. So what separates a black box from lithium? We don't have living wills where we say, please don't treat me with lithium. Right? Um, and I would, I, would, I would like to throw this idea at you. Um, artificial neural networks, all still in theory, are broadly capable of handing differential diagnoses and treatment options across the entire scope of emergency medicine. And so from the patient's perspective, the question about an advanced directive, uh, a living will here, uh, is not so much are you willing to be subject to an opaque technology, but rather would you be willing to have a computer 
take on the many functions of a doctor? I think that's what we're really asking. This is a big question with huge philosophical implications. And so the question, would you be willing to be prescribed lithium, is minuscule in import compared to AI. Just some ideas about that. Uh, those were my concerns about consent. We'll now move to culture, agency, and privacy. New dilemma. If Oscar is a computer programmer, say an AI programmer, or for me, he's from a hunter-gatherer tribe in a rainforest, how differently will he react to the black box? So we've already sort of touched on this question. So does a healthcare provider's right to be paternalistic towards patients increase with the patient's relative lack of knowledge about how artificial intelligence works? What do you think? Oscar knows all about bugs. Sorry? Oscar knows all about bugs. About bugs? Yeah, in the software. In the software. <laughs> okay, okay. That's not <laughs> I, I was wondering, bugs in the tropical rainforest. Yeah, okay, yeah. They both know about bugs. <laughs> right, yeah. One of your assumptions is that AI is known to the patient all the time. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? Why, why would the patient be aware of that the, that the doctor has an AI as a tool in, in his practice? Wow, okay. They, they, you're, you're right. I mean, the, the patient may never be told by the, uh, there. I can imagine situations where I mean, another black box for a med medical doctor is that he has for perhaps some recommendations from from authorities in the country he lives in, mm -hmm. social studies <laughs> mm -hmm. or whatever, and or he has uh, some uh, meta -an analysis of uh, two thousand articles in medical journals, mm -hmm. which he doesn't have. A, clue about what they are writing about, but, but mm -hmm. he trusts the mm -hmm. meta-analysis and which give him directives on, on how to proceed the diagnosis or whatever. Okay, okay. It does. So, oh, and the patient is not aware of that either. Mm -hmm. So why would AI be of the patient's awareness at all? I mean, any, any, any reactions to that? Yeah, please. yeah please. I have one reaction. You have uh, meta information on the reviews and, and those kind of stuff that will will basically. I mean, you have multiple layers of all arg arguments which make this meta study being valid, and you know that there is a trail of logic applied here, which is potentially visible to the person where. Yeah, about the in, no, no, but I mean, I, I you, you can argue for that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you can argue for that as a doctor, where where you have this trail where in, uh, for example, neural network, and, which is uh, the black box, uh, you, you don't have that train yeah. of, of logic. Therefore, I would say it's slightly different, yeah, but I understand your... For, for the doctor, but not for, for yeah. the patient. Yeah. Yeah. That was my only point. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? So, uh, a couple of principles are at play here. One is impartiality, right? Doctors are supposed to treat everybody the same regardless of their background. Um, and then there's this famous quote from Arthur Clarke Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've, if you've heard that quote before. Yeah. This is something we really need to keep in mind. I can tell you this for sure because I worked in Nicaragua, and especially outside the cities, we regularly had patients who believed, for example, that they were possessed by evil spirits, or, they were, or their, their family members were possessed by evil spirits, and that's why they were in such pain or, or uh, suffering. Um, you, you, one way to think about this is, you can, if, you had, if there were a line of like the adequate knowledge of AI architecture, Uppsala Oscar needs to go like this far. Right? Whereas hunter-gatherer Oscar has to go like this far. Right? Um, and all this is really important because um, you know, if you go to a hunter-gatherer tribe and you just bust out AI technology, right? uh, to them, using it may simply appear like magic. Right? And if it fails, you've got a real problem on your hand. They say, what happened? 
Like, why was the computer wrong? And you ha your answer is, well, I don't know. I don't understand what the computer's logic was, right? And if you do that, you could easily destroy that faith, any faith that that village has in computers, in your clinic. Um, uh, these are very undesirable consequences. Yeah? Wouldn't that be the same if you prescribed them lithium and they died? That's a great question. <sighs> Respond, uh, re okay, yeah. Um, wouldn't that be the same as if you prescribed them lithium or a medicine that you do not exactly know how it works and they die? Mm. But I, I don't really think so, because then it's easier to explain, well, oh, some bodies react in a certain way to yeah, a certain exactly. medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So it can happen to your body, but it's not the same as saying, oh, you weren't actually sick, which, you know, is this whole case, were you or weren't you? No, That's what the exactly. AI is kind of deciding at this point, right? But if the AI then decides that you're sick and your antidote is to prescribe them lithium. Yeah. Isn't it the same? Well, I would say. Say. well the, the the reasoning behind it. Well, this said that you were sick, so we prescribed you lithium, or I thought you were sick, so we prescribed you lithium and it reacted wrongly. Yeah, but the question or is faulty. were you sick? Did I bring it? Right? Yeah, but then is there a difference between the person's opinion and the AI's opinion? I think to a lot of people yes. that would be trust people if you're used to trusting people basically my i've been taught by my parents to trust the doctor mm -hmm. um, my parents don't trust the ai and i think if my parents went for the ai instead of a doctor i would probably trust the ai growing up <laughs> but yeah since i was a baby i've been taught this to trust interesting so it's cultural yeah. Hmm? yeah so how about this guideline the availability of black boxes and the type of public education about them should be chosen carefully, taking into account the effect the technology will have on any given society. We have to do real anthropological and sociological research before we just bring AI into a, a, a culture whose technological level is not that of an advanced industrialized economy like ours. Um, and that could actually be said for a lot of different technologies, like genetic engineering or search engines, <laughs> right? Or nuclear weapons. But I want to say that there is something very special about AI. It's virtually the only technology that is so inscrutable that it cannot be reverse engineered. And as we've noted in the future, it may be able to reproduce itself. It also can appear to act with intention. So black boxes, are the most human-like technology we've created, especially when combined with robotics, right? So its introduction into a society takes on the characteristics of introducing a new person into that society. And then we get to the notion of AI personhood. There's a lot of logical leaps there, and there's a lot of things you could argue with, but I, I just want to sort of throw out that set of ideas as a way to analyze this situation. Uh, our fifth, uh, oh, okay, yeah, and the, uh, yeah. And then what would, we, let's just quickly talk about th th what Kant would say about this. If we start thinking about AI as a person, right, our, our deontological tradition says that then it has rights and responsibilities and can be assumed, and can be, do morally good things or can be assigned fault, which is what you got, we, we brought up. Right? Yeah. So we'll talk about fault later, but here's our next dilemma. Ready? Imagine you had in Uppsala a brilliant, world famous doctor whose cardiac diagnoses were 94% correct, but spoke not a word of English, Svenska, or any other language you understand, and you did not have a translator nearby. He could only indicate whether he thought there was a heart attack with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay? <laughs> How strongly would you take his or her word for things? And the principle we're getting at is in what relevant way is a black box different from a non-communicative human? Reactions? Hmm? I think for me, the only difference is, again, with uh, accountability. Because mm -hmm. you can 
charge and sue that yeah. person. You can never charge and sue a black person. So you're talking, about, you're talking about legal consequences. Exactly. Okay. For a thumb down? Yeah, so if he gives the wrong thumb down, and then they do the surgery and the patient and dies. But he, he doesn't do the surgery. No, but based on his decision, he, the doctors he, made. He gives an opinion. You can't be held juridically consequently. No, uh, but morally. That's not true. Yeah. That's true. I don't know. I, don't know. Yeah, I think the difference to me would be lived experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that doctor, she's seen a lot. Mm -hmm. She's seen not only black and white, she's seen all the grays is what mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. And would be able to make a, a decision based on that, based on lived experience. Mm -hmm. And the AI system is fed with data. Okay. And makes a decision based on that. And I don't know how you catch the grayscale, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be in there, but it might not be <laughs> okay. in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking in terms of that, like, uh, if, you, if you have an AI that gets fed, like, say, 10,000 patient files, if we took that example from earlier, the, the AI can still make an assumption based on that the same way that this doctor would be able to form her own opinion based on that. Uh, whereas the only tangible difference would be a body, you know, where, whereas you could say that no matter, well, okay, there are certain people that are, have photographic memory and are brilliant in, in what they do. Where, but I would still say that an AI that could be fed with every single medical journal that has ever been published and still use that as a basis for their sort of um, uh, conclusion or response would still have a wider sample size to make this decision based on compared to a human. Sample size, absolutely, but maybe not parameters, right? There are only, you still have to some how choose what parameters are fed into that system and you don't know if that doctor has caught anything else through lived experience that well these two things are not on paper connected but blah you know so i don't know yeah I mean, that's, that, that's <laughs> what i was thinking about i saw your hand up do you know yeah about accountability yeah. as, as Fatima talked about we i think we must distinguish between if this doctor or an ai it makes an advice or a decision because uh, the one who has the right to make a decision can be held accountable, but the one who gives advice can't, maybe okay. can't. Interesting. Be Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I would suggest that uh, the difference, there are many th ways in which the, the, the AI could be like a human. Uh, if you're familiar with the Star Trek doctor on Voyager, he's just called the doctor. He's actually a holographic doctor who looks like a human and uh, acts like a human, but he's a computer. Data from Star Trek also is like that. But the one thing I would argue that distinguishes the human from the computer is agency. Uh, there are a lot of definitions of agency. I'm going to borrow one from Harry Frankfurt, a philosopher of the early 1980s. Uh, Human beings are not alone in having desires and motives and making choices, right? We share those things with animals, right? But what is particular to humans is that we have second order desires. So besides wanting or choosing or being moved to do something, people also can want to have certain desires. They can want, we can want to want something. And an AI, as least as we, as they're created right now, does not ever want to want. It has its goals, which are trained by its creators, right? But it can't get out of that loop of, of following the goals that it was trained, right? So any safe artificial network, neural network or any safe black box is built specifically, in my opinion, never to ask itself the question, should I have a different intention, right? Now, imagine that happened in, a, in an emergency room, right? The computer started asking itself, like, uh, you know, should I really be interested in the welfare of the patients, right? It would put the programmers in a real pickle, right? It's kind of futuristic. Uh, maybe the computer would just start, like, returning the names of all the patients whose 
start, well, all the patients whose name starts with E, right, instead of, uh, instead of predicting heart attacks or whatever. But <clears throat> the important point here is that black boxes should never be built that have any capacity to autonomously change the goals that they were not originally trained to obtain by humans. Does that make sense? And so <clears throat> there's an opportunity cost to this. This constrains autonomous AI development. And you know, ethical AI is something that is in the works. I mean, there are people trying to program computers to think ethically, right? And if somehow we could create a computer which really distinguished between right and wrong, and the, at least as we agree upon it, you know, then we could let that thing loose in an emergency ward, and it could go from task to task, patient to patient, solving problems probably better than a human being ever would, right? Maximizing help, minimizing harm. Uh, and that technology might be more beneficial than a regular human doctor, right? So we, we really constrain ourselves when we, when we start worrying about, uh, about uh, uh, computers changing their, 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 their goals. Um, we could talk more about the, the, the definition of autonomy here, but let's move on to dilemma six. <clears throat> the AI has gotten a hold of a Facebook message intended by Oscar to be private, but published, unknown to him, in which he mentions he's a hypochondriac, and he is sometimes fakes chest pain in order to see a doctor. So the AI included this message in its analysis, such that Oscar did not have a heart attack, okay? Now here, the AI has taken a piece of information that Oscar did not intend to tell the doctor. Do we discard the AI's results, assuming we know what it did? Or what, what if we don't? And the question here is, so how much should we limit the information available to black boxes? I get a lot of flashbacks to the house series. OK, yes, you're right. Yeah, he was. A, Definitely, like on the edge of ethics. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm thinking that uh, actually, in, in this case, we should not. Uh, we should actually discard the results. Okay. Based on the principle that the, the, the patient's actual experience is, experience is what we have to go with. Okay. Uh, as a basis, uh, at least. Uh, which, which I think is at least is a quite important principle as well in in in, 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 in medics, uh, because what what do we otherwise got to to, to go with? Uh, then of course you can run tests and so on, and, and that part would probably uh, so, so the AI would probably come to that conclusion anyway mm -hmm. that no, he doesn't have a heart failure, and that is. Probably enough in this case as well. So, so, but we should always trust the patient's experience. So, okay. So. Other reactions? Yeah. I agree with Roman on that one, but I uh, also <laughs> kind of think that, like, uh, in in the case of such such like information being taken into account, wouldn't it then be? Uh, pertinent or possible to just run a whole bunch of other tests as well. Then you kind of, then you end up in, in one of the boxes that we were in where you just wait and you run more tests. Mm -hmm. Fine. You put him into risk more, but then on the other hand, it might not be as, as uh, relevant to get that person into surgery right away. Mm -hmm. We do see that the blood pressure is increased which I guess you could probably fake or at least take something to increase the blood pressure if, mm -hmm. if he's really serious about his craft of hypochondria. <laughs> but, but like, uh, then you could still run yeah. the other tests related to it and, and sort of afford the, the extra time that it would take okay. because it's, it's still possible that he could have had a heart attack, but it, the chance or risk of it might decrease. Okay. But we'll, we'll talk. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I think it reminds me of a funny story. Like when we were kids, like they told us from one farmer that he always cleans his wolf, there is wolf. 
and uh, like people laugh, uh, uh, people have to respond, and then when there was real, uh, real war, yeah. like nobody can to, to rescue him. Yeah. So here we don't know really the the weight of the, um, this message, like how he how it takes, for example, have faith, uh, faith, uh, chest pain. So it's a black box. So we don't know how much weight he like it gives to that. Message. Right. So. For me, I would question that. Like, I would take like, okay, we will see. Um, we can take it as uh, an extra input, but not like all the decision is made uh, based on. Because it should be weighted weighted less than other. Yeah. Yeah. I think there must be very uh, qualitative information which can be used by the AI by checking the patient's uh, social media mm. or whatever information that right. can gather from the internet. Because what Dr. House in the show t taught us, it was everybody lies. So uh, every patient lies. Mm. And there's a lot of small details in the living circumstances of the patient that can explain or direct the doctor to the right diagnosis or mm. treatment. Or okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would like to give some nuance to my... my, my first argument. I mean, to be honest, hypochondria is also a, a condition, which is also something that will restrict the human being from, from a normal life, mm -hmm. which should then, if, if nowadays, be treated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in terms of that, I mean, the AI could also be used to identify that mm -hmm. uh, pattern, and yeah. maybe you can help the patient. So, yeah. it, it's, it can be used as a way of, of seeing more. Okay. Uh, but then it's also the risk that in as is into that the the cry wolf uh, problem that yeah. you might just discard it yeah. totally because it's he's he's just shouting wolf again. Okay, so um, I, I want to uh, these these ideas are fantastic. I want to say something which may be controversial. Okay, um, before I get into the guideline, the value of black boxes may be in the fact that they are black, right? in this case, right? Because there, there may be information that Oscar would not want to tell a human doctor, but would be perfectly happy to have a machine know, assuming that the machine was confidential and perfectly confidential, right? Um, so we actually have an argument to preserve the blackness of black boxes. So the guideline is that black boxes should be used to only use public information intended to be private if they can recognize it's private and preserve its privacy whenever any means is used to see inside the box. But this is not technologically mastered yet, and we've got a long way to go. But until privacy recognition is technologically mastered, there should be human oversight over all the sources uh, that an AI uses to mine information. Uh, I'm going to skip over the objection to that. Um, and uh, there's an issue of proxy discrimination I'd love to talk about, but we don't have time. So let's move to our last concern. It's on fault. Suppose the AI turned, you know, we, we've, we've been dodging around this issue for the last hour now, OK? So now let's get right to the heart of it, OK? Suppose the AI turns out to be wrong on further testing, and Oscar has died during the surgery, during the angioplasty. Is it your fault, the doctor, for trusting the, the AI? Is it the creator of the AI's fault? Is it the AI's fault? for being wrong? Or is fault somehow distributed? What do you think? Whom do we assign blame when a black box fails? I mean, logically speaking, I would say that the person who made the decision to actually put the patient into surgery would be the one who is largely responsible, mm -hmm. at least. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, I might agree with that, but at the same time, I think that uh, a black box should know that it made a mistake. So that it will be able to update itself, so that it will not do the same mistake again. Right. Okay. So, so it learns from its mistakes. Yeah, it should. To sort of Oscar's. Like, yeah, it should sort of like unfortunate disadvantage. At the same time, like it should be a punishmental system for the AI itself. Like, I okay. Don't know how that would be like, Let's assume the programmers have built that in. Actually, yeah, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Punish the system. Yes, but uh, it's too late for Oscar. I mean. No, it's too late yeah. for Oscar. <laughs> yeah. But it's same with every medical like, doctor. If you make a mistake and someone unfortunately dies, yeah. the doctor is goes on trial. The, the person will not be alive again. Mm -hmm. But then there is a punishment for that. Yeah. Person. Okay. Well, I have a comment on yeah. exactly that. Sorry, Victor. But, it's, it's all right. but it can happen then that 
if it's unethical to train, continue to train is because it will change the behavior. So it might have a success rate now of 95, but the 5% that they missed have changed. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, <coughs> for you some mean, individuals, it can be be worse yeah. due to, to the additional information. Because mm-hmm. there were some characteristics, for example, that uh, was the same for me and Oscar. Yeah. So when I arrived, they assessed me wrong. So it can be also that. Well, okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just thinking about if you have a learning system and say that, well, Oscar's cause of, well, well, the mistake that the system made when analyzing Oscar's particular case, uh, it gets fed like the information, it knows what it did wrong, but it still commits the same mistake once more. Then I think perhaps the fault is not entirely with the person who made the decision to uh, send the patient to surgery. Because then like the premises for the for the decision has changed. Okay. I saw a hand here and yep. Yep. Whoever. Okay. Yes. Speak. All right. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking just like if, if we take it the other way around, you do the, the, the I forgot the name of it, the biological test, the chemical Tro- test. Troponin T. Troponin T yeah. test. And, and that one says that he has, has a heart attack. He goes into surgery and he dies. I don't think the same uh, discussion will be had. You, mm-hmm. would, you, would assign, you wouldn't assign blame to the, to the one that developed the test or to the one that suggests that you use the test. You would probably assign the blame to the doctor and the doctor would probably be in the clear because mm. the doctor has just acted according to what the test would say. Okay. And, and uh, I would say that the same would probably go for asking for a second opinion. You, you wouldn't necessarily put the second doctor like on the stand or, or charge him with anything for giving a second opinion. So why should an AI have a different, why should it be a different outcome? Okay. So my thought. Yeah. It, it just goes back to the guideline you just brought up, yeah. Eric, that you should not take AI as something that would change your decision based yeah. on. Because if the doctors put too much weight on AI, then that becomes a problem. But mm-hmm. I agree with you. After just see it as a. Yeah. Also, I was uh, referring to that when I was talking about parts before, but what if there is. Um, Programming errors, to speak, in in the black box. Who is to blame them? I mean, it's like it's like if the uh, dopamine test uh, was uh, faulty. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the same thing in a way. Yeah, let's look at how some scholars have tried to answer this question really quickly. The two solutions that have come up is that the AI is a person, simply that. And then any liability would, like financial liability, would be spread out among the users of the AI, like this, the same way that doctors are insured by their hospitals. There's common enterprise liability, which means that uh, everybody involved in the impl- implementation of the AI jointly bears some responsibility. But the AI does not take on the status of personhood. Only humans are blamed for the error. Another solution is an interesting with sliding scale of liability. So you look at how transparent or black the AI is, and how much supervision there was. So a transparent black box, uh, sorry, transparent, that's a contradiction. A transparent AI, which is heavily supervised, there you can use traditional medical tests of intent and causation. But if you have a black box which is less supervised, there's a broad scope of liability because everybody sort of let this thing run wild in the clinical situation. Um, uh, so, which solution do we choose? Well, uh, n- negligence in medicine is usually defined by the principle of due care. And due care requires that the clinician is prudent. And prudence is an interesting thing. It refers to wise practical reasoning in general, as well as considered risk taking when necessary to achieve the good. And risk thresholds are not something that AIs decide. That is what the doctor decides, okay? I'm willing to implement this only if it's 94% right or 88% right or not. 
right? So it is the doctor, it's not the computer who decides whether that risk threshold is good enough to trust the AI's judgment. But since AI may soon be creating new AIs, <clears throat> we even might have biocomputers creating new biocomputers. We're, we're ending up in a situation where we're going to have computers made by computers, made by computers, made by computers. And then if we're going to assign fault to creators, at a certain point, that chain gets too long where it's, where it's fair at all to say, all right, the original programmer is at fault, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a big problem. Um, and as I talked about before, some people uh, see this AI replication as a wonderful thing, like Ray Kurzweil, he sees that as hailing the singularity. But if the AI starts making bad ethical decisions, then we end up in a dystopian scenario, like uh, Stephen Hawking has warned us against, uh, and runaway AI. So I would uh, say that this question of fault, to me, is unsolvable, for personally. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. But we want to get away from the question as much as possible. And the way to do it is to constantly make black boxes as close to transparent as possible. And I think that's a really important guideline. But then we must invent a new concept of transparency, because as you said, neural networks mm -hmm. can't by definition be transparent because they change uh, over time. Right. So what does transparency mean in this context? That is the question that we perhaps must figure out. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And here I was going to ask you uh, actually the same question. Should mm -hmm. uh, transparency be as close as possible? <laughs> because the way I can picture uh, transparency to link to Pierre's question is uh, finding, and this is why I talked about this logic argument, uh, find a way that you can present the logical argument, so you can present the step, perhaps not what is between the step, but you can present some kind of an argument. That would be really human-like. Uh, that would be uh, the way, I mean, when I say, I, I judge this because I saw a pen here and then I took the pen and I threw it at him. I mean, you don't know what's going on in my mind, but in a certain way, you have a train of thought. Mm. And I think that might be a solution. We, we have to wrap it up, but sure, yeah, one more yeah, comment. Yeah, but what, just one short reflection. Yeah. I mean, when we do not trust a doctor, for example, we can get a second opinion. And perhaps that might be also what we will see when it comes to AI. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we add some facts about the doctor here, maybe he, he is responsible for the budget. They had a new budget constraints saying that a surgery will cost this amount. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor will say to this patient, who, by the way, might be 75 years old, yeah. we do not mm -hmm. recommend a surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are... I mean, it's not all the time that the doctor is that transparent. Right. Yeah. right. So what do we do then? We, we get a second opinion. Right. But right. first, I would argue, you a little bit try to question. Yeah, but what the doctor might insane. say that, well, based on yeah. this medical, yeah. and this, then yeah. they might say, we have done all these tests that show this and this. Yeah. Of course, you won't mention the medical yeah. strength. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's not always that people are that kind of transparent. Mm -hmm. Decision making either. Right. Uh, all of you in this room, well, most of you in this room are involved somehow in the development of computing. And I, I implore you to keep in mind that this is a question of resources, right? Always balance out your development of AI with the development of AI forensics, right? Don't forget that it's really important that we know that we get better and better at penetrating neural networks, right? Um, because that can prevent nightmare scenarios. Um, uh, for those of you staying for FICA afterwards, I'd love to show you a short clip from Star Trek The Next Generation, which is a, a, a debate, a trial, about whether a robot, doc, a robot is, has rights or not. Um, uh, and uh, just want to conclude, here are our guidelines for today. You can also find them in my thesis, which is online. I'll give you the, uh, the, the link. Uh, and remember the big takeaway. To, you guys all in this room perform some fantastic ethical analysis of my field, which is AI in medicine and communication. 
So I want to close with a rhetorical question. What are the ethical guidelines of your field? And how can you help think more and more about the ethics of whatever you are doing? Ethical systems take time. The first medical ethical system we have is the Hippocratic Oath, which dates back as far as 275 AD, C, no, CE. Uh, the first British, English, ethical medical code was 1803. The first American one was 1847. So it literally took 1,500 years to develop a medical ethical code in the West. This is an urgent problem. There are people who are manipulating computers uh, in order to produce false results in medicine so that they can get insurance uh, 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 paybacks. Uh, this, they, this person found a way to manipulate just a couple pictures and a, two, and a picture of a mole to make it appear malignant, to make it appear cancerous, and then get uh, and able to get back uh, all the insurance money reimbursement. That's the kind of stuff that happens in America. Um, uh, as patients encounter ever more advanced information technology in the clinic, it's in their best interest that computer use be held to as high a standard of professional practice as possible. And that is the ethics of handling medical emergencies with artificially intelligent black boxes. Thank you so much for participating. And thank you, Eric. Mm. It's been very interesting, mind blowing is another <laughs> word. And thank you all for your uh, discussion. Very interesting. Yeah. Better than when you and I did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you had a lot of great stuff to say. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Say. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now it's time for Fika afterwards. Um, I have a comment. Yeah. But I will give you that in the coffee room. Okay. So that's uh, like a, a teaser for everyone to go to the coffee room. Okay, everyone to go to the coffee now room. Now it's time for Fika. Everyone is invited to the coffee room at the department. Okay. And we thank you very much for giving this presentation. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. See you at Fika.